And this evening's discussion is Nirvana Day or Nehaye in Japanese. And I'll begin with an overview that uh, Pair Nirvana Day or Nirvana Day is celebrated by Japanese Buddhists, Nehane, on the 8th in some schools and on the 15th in other schools of February. The term Pair Nirvana and Nirvana for Shakyamuni Buddha's death are used interchangeably most of the time. Just a reminder that in East Asian Buddhism, Shakyamuni Buddha's birth, death, and day of enlightenment are celebrated on separate days based upon the actual dates of the occurrence. For South Asia and Tibetan Buddhists, all three events are celebrated together as Vesak, usually in May, on different dates based upon a lunar calendar. And this is an approximation that is Vesak, is an approximation of the day that Siddhartha Gautama was born. Nirvana Day commemorates the death of the historical Buddha and his entry into final or complete Nirvana. This is viewed as a celebration rather than as a memorial. At temples and monasteries, this is the time for contemplation of the Buddhist teachings. Some hold meditation retreats, others open their doors to lay persons to bring gifts of money and household goods to support monks and nuns. And it's also a time for pilgrimages to temples and other sacred sites in East Asia. In India, there are four sites for pilgrimages where he was born, where Shakyamuni Buddha was born. Lubimi was where he was born, his awakening at Bodh Gaya, the place of his first teaching, Sarnath, and the place of his death, Krishnagari. According to the legend, Shakyamuni Buddha gathered his disciples, chose the time of his death, and poisoned himself so as to die at the time of his choosing. Or, did he die of natural causes at the age of 80 after teaching for 45 years? Both versions of the death of Buddha are endorsed by scholars, and it's difficult to separate the more epic versions from what may have actually occurred. Some evidence suggests he died from mesenteric infarction, an often fatal condition of the intestines not uncommon in elderly people. Some scholars, based upon the same text, suggest that he died from eating pork and others from mushrooms. It should be pointed out here that the actual century years, let alone the dates of Shakyamuni Buddha's birth and death, are not known. He lived, according to the scholars in the South Asian tradition, between the 6th and 5th century BCE, and according to East Asian and Tibetan scholars, between the 5th and the 4th century BCE. We do know that a historical person lived and died. We know where his life took place. We have a record of his teachings, many of his disciples, and the philosophy and practices he advocated. The earliest version found in the Maha Parinibbana Sutra, Sutta 16 in the Niga Nikaya, this is the longest discourse in the Pali Canon. In six chapters, it describes the last year of Buddha's life. It is also equally possible that the text was originally intended as a hagiography, not a historical record of events. There are a number of foundational Buddhist teachings that are reiterated through the narrative, reiterated meanings. We find these same teachings in, in other places, but they're just one over another time. And in great detail, it describes Buddha's death and cremation. And that is what is important about the Nikaya accounts. The death narrative itself, I'll recount a version found in the Pali Canon. And please recognize that there are different narratives and even more interpretations. And I don't claim to agree with one narrative over another. I'm just sharing a summary story that's found by consensus in the Pali Canon. And this is a greatly shortened version. Otherwise, we'd be here all night because it's, it's quite a long uh, list of things that occurred. Shakyamuni Buddha journeyed with Ananda, his personal attendant, from Rajagaha to Kushinagari in 14 stages and gave teachings to each of the different audiences. Now, 
this is where we could spend the whole night talking about that because we could go over all 14 of the teachings that he gave uh, during that time. The subjects of the teachings were on governance, the unity of the Sangha, morality, and the formal noble truths, as well as, as well as other things. He's now 80 years old and becoming progressively more ill, and he uses deep meditation to keep his disease in check. He describes his body as being like an old cart held together by straps. And by the way, the, the building that you see in the lower right-hand corner is the, was built on the site of where he allegedly had died. The Buddha tells Ananda he'd like to address the Sangha. Ananda thought he was going to teach something that he had not yet taught. However, Buddha says that he's already revealed everything there is to teach, but nevertheless, Ananda assembles the disciples. After a series of teachings and an encounter with Mara, he requests a last meal from the blacksmith Kunda called Pig's Delight. This is where the scholarly discussion as to what Shakyamuni Buddha died from is centered. Was this actually minced pig meat or mushrooms, which pigs enjoy? He also instructed his disciples not to share the meal with him and that the meal should be buried after his death so that none of his disciples could eat it. This being because it was poison, not intentionally by Kunda, but by Shakyamuni Buddha himself. Today, this would be viewed as self-euthanasia. Shortly after the meal, Buddha travels outside of town. He lies down between twin, twin solid trees, which are blooming out of season, instructs Ananda to visit Kunda to reassure him that he was not to blame for his death and that he should rejoice at having given Buddha his last meal. Asking the monks, laity, and divinities assembled if they have any questions, there are none. And he tells them, all conditions are subject to, to decay. Strive with diligence. And then he dies. I think that's probably a pretty good way to go. And then we have the story of the cremation in the Nikaya account. The Buddha's consciousness and body pass through various stages of dhyana in the various realms of materiality, semi-materiality, and immateriality, up and down through eight levels. Seven days later, his body was prepared for cremation. They awaited to start the cremation until Mahasakasapya, who had been away, had returned. When he returned, the funeral pyre ignited spontaneously. You've got to have a little bit of magic in here, otherwise it's not a tale worth telling. The relics of the Buddha's remains after cremation were apportioned to eight kings to carry back to their kingdoms. It was from these eight collections of bones that King Ashoka obtained the 64,000 relics that were later dispersed throughout Asia. Let's look at the Mahayana Nirvana Sutra. First, Sanskrit versions are dated to about the third century CE. And there are several translations by Fashion and Dharma Kashiba appearing early in the fifth century CE, based upon different Sanskrit sources. Translations of the Mahaparabhana Sutanata were translated into Chinese, but this is not the same sutra as the Mahayana Nirvana Sutra. The former, that is to say the Mahaparabhana Sutra, is based on the Pali, and the latter one is one that's more influent, the more influential sutra in East Asia. And it, it meaning the, the Mahayana Nirvana Sutra, is considered along with the Lotus Sutra, complete teaching is also much longer than the Mahaparinirvana Sutra. Many of the events of last year of Shakyamuni Buddha's life are the same 
in both the Mahayana version as well as the Pali version. But the Mahayana version, the teachings are expanded upon, and the death of the Buddha is not the core theme. And though it's prominent, it, you'll find out that there are other teachings in there that are considered to be perhaps more important. The first is the Buddha asserts that he will disappear from sight and will not die. Because in fact, according to the sutra, he was never born in the first place. Buddhas are not created phenomena and therefore have no beginning and no end. The core themes are the Tathagata Garbha and Shunyata, and expresses this as Buddha nature, Tathagata nature, and hidden treasury, and hold this is true not only of Buddhists, but of all living things. In conclusion, the death of Shakyamuni Buddha has a great deal to tell us about the Buddha path and Shasana, the teachings, practices, and doctrines of the Buddha. The century, year, or date are really not important. It's important that we mark the event, however. And I have provided an extremely edited version of Shakyamuni Buddha's Mahaparinirvana, referring to the Pali and the Sanskrit in summary. The recounting of the last year of Buddha's life, as I said before, could have included 14 separate discourses to different audiences in different places. The Buddha crossing a river using his mag magical powers and describing to the distraught where their deceased loved ones have been reborn, all from the Pali Canon. This is a kind of introduction to Buddhism itself. The Mahayana Sanskrit version expands on each of these, includes the four pilgrimages that one should take to attain awakening, includes the ikantika, incorrigibles, who might not reach awakening, and then goes further in establishing itself as a Mahayana primer. In this context, it is considered one of the most influential Patagatagarbha texts in East Asia. In the West, we give very little attention to the, to the three events in Shakyamuni Buddha's life. And this is observed much more in Asia. Some of that may be due to cultural predisposition, and some may be due to Buddhist modernism orientation. Most schools pay attention to his awakening, Bodhi Day. Then some schools set aside his birth. We celebrate as Anamatsuri, the flower festival. But far fewer pay attention to the death of Shakyamuni Buddha. The historical character. Each of these events is equally important in what they teach us about nirvana, the dharma, and ourselves. From a Tendai perspective, it's important that we view the historical Buddha's birth, awakening, and death as a continuum. Shakyamuni Buddha's death was the death of a physical being, but he continues to live in the teachings and practices. We hold not only the sutra, but the marvelous commentary, shastra, and discussions they create as the embodiment of his teachings, not distinguished from the person himself. And really quickly, these are some of the sources I use for this evening's uh, discussion. And if you're interested in those, instead of copying down, just drop me an email and I'm happy to, to pass them on to you. <clears throat> I thought this was a great picture. <laughs> yes, there is. Are there any questions, comments, or thoughts? And I'll unmute everyone to uh, share. Okay, what questions, comments, <coughs> or thoughts do you have? Oh, Mushin, uh, we, we got Mushin's question first. Use the word hagiography. Hagiography for. A hagiography is a, bio, is, a, is a biography of anyone in which they're hyper, hyperbolic, it's extended, it may have mythology mixed in with it, it may have acts of heroism and that sort of thing. So it's, it's beyond a pure historical, it's not pure historical doctrine, right? right. Yeah. What other questions Sorry. might we have? Jake, go ahead. So you had mentioned the the two dates of February. Was it the eighth and the fifteenth? Yes. Uh, which one does Tendai celebrate? 
Typically, Tendai celebrates the 15th. Okay. Right, Sensei? Yes. Okay. Uh, February 15th is uh, Nehan. We call it the Nirvana Day. So most of the temples, they uh, celebrate or uh, instead of chanting sutra, just, you know, opening uh, and the Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra, uh, 600 volumes, uh, just in a day, so that there may be worms uh, uh, away. And so uh, the wind uh, from the, you know, uh, <clears throat> sutras uh, opening and closing and then that the wind uh, maybe dispels all the uh, illusions or badness etc uh, that is uh, nirvana day we do it but depends upon the all the temples uh, sometimes days are different for instance uh, in our area uh, January uh, uh, 16th, we have uh, Hanya Day, Prajnya Day, so we do it uh, to avoid uh, the calamity of the fire of the houses, so Hibuse no Kami, so uh, <clears throat> in order to keep the houses uh, safe out of fire, we do it, that kind of ceremony at the Anyoji Temple, uh, near our temple, where my son is uh, head of the temple. So what, what Sensei was talking about with the sutra is that the sutra is going from one, is fanned from one side to the other. So, 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 so. That's in, this, right. in this fashion. Yeah, I don't yeah, know if yeah. you can it very well. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty impressive when you see, let's say, a dozen monks who are doing that. The volumes are much larger. And so it's it's a tradition to to do it in that in that fashion, and then slam them down. That's that's what he's talking about. Are there any other questions or thoughts? One on the end, yeah. Yes. Bendu. Yeah. Bendu. Oh. This is a thought. Would that be possible that in the future slides, when there are um, significant terms or terminologies, could you add Japanese kanji next to it? <laughs> in some cases, I can, but it's it's also a, a matter of the space that we have sometimes. Okay. That's a, yes. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. a good suggestion. Thank you. Are there any other? Questions or thoughts or comments? Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you uh, mentioned that a Buddha is never born and never dies. <laughs> right. the, yeah, that, that is one of the statements that comes from the Mahayana Sutra. In other words, one of the <clears throat> I would I would say between the Arhat path and the Bodhisattva path is when the, an Arhat reaches final extinction. As I say, the, the yeah. self is blown away, the, the karmic stream is blown away, so there's nothing to return to samsara. If you have a situation where a bodhisattva is the, is the premise, then the bodhisattva is reborn to continue working for the benefit of others. How can you have a Buddha who would, a Buddha would die or a Buddha would be born? There have been according to which tradition many hundreds, perhaps thousands of Buddhas previous to Shakyamuni Buddha, and then after that, but they're all a continuous stream. They are not born, nor they nor do they die. They come from uh, Buddha nature. Yeah, but in the Parinirvana Sutra, the Buddha dies. That's what I said. I said in the Mahayana Nirvana Sutra, that's, that's one of the differences between the sutra. Because the Pali Canon in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, that's the extinction as an Arhat would experience. But in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, the Buddhas continue to, to live on. And just the corporal body. Yeah, the, 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 corp, the corporal body is gone, but the yeah. spirit okay. it, it, it right. persists. Yeah. Did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, it was a 
um, self annihilation, like against like the Buddha way, like. I'm not sure what you mean, self annihilation. Uh, you said that like one of the um, possibilities is that the Buddha like poisoned himself. Oh right, yeah, self use the use the nation. Yeah, so in within Buddhism, it's not suggested that one do it. <laughs> it's just not recommended. That it's song. not recommended. <laughs> yeah. but, we, but we have we have other examples where a Buddha will give himself. And it really brings us to a larger issue, and that is the right to the right to die. Mushin is working on that right now, an advocate of death with dignity. If if you feel that you would rather take your own life in, in a humane fashion, from presumably, right, then that's preferable to living without dignity. Yeah. And so, as it was pointed out in the Ma Nirvana Sutra. There, one of the, I, I'm sorry, in the Pali Canon, one of the readings by scholars is that he wanted to choose when he died. He had been suffering for, of illness for a while, and he was meditating in order to uh, hold off the illness. But then he reached a point, he said, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he took he pulled the, the straps off. The right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there any other? Aaron. Aaron. So I had a, a question. Like, I know that there's other Buddhas. Um, and like in their world systems, do they die the same way as our Buddha Sakamuni did? I don't think that we have much record of how, of how they died, to be honest with you. We just know that they lived. And we see references to them. We see references to them in the Lotus Sutra and other sutras to the Buddhas that lived previous to Shakyamuni Buddha, but they don't necessarily report how they died. Ralph, Ralph, Ralph. Ralph, you had your hand up? Yeah, exactly. Um, this is the, 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 the area to a certain extent that I have the greatest difficulty understanding, and that is uh, the two concepts of, of karma and reincarnation. Um, and I had difficulty understanding it and difficulty describing it to people. Um, and uh, so I was uh, uh, just uh, wondering at what point or are there good references for that or, or, or what as to how to, how to go ahead and get a, a better handle on what it means. Well, there, there are some references and I'll, I'll see if I can find some that, that I might recommend for you. Um, but keep it keep in mind also that um, when we're talking about karma, ultimately it means one's actions. What you do in right now, today, like previously in your life, what's coming up has an effect on everything that occurs after. When yeah. we're deal, dealing with rebirth, and, and all karma means it's literally, literally literally translated as actions. And after one, when we're talking about rebirth, reincarnation is a, a different concept. It's not the individual who has rebirth. So Ralph is Ralph, and he's unique. He's never going to be re reborn. That's yes, it. I remember, I remember that you, back when I first uh, 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 met you, that you, you corrected me on that a aspect and, and told me the, 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 when you die, your ego dies with, it, with you. And, uh, and it's, so it's not... The individual person at all that that uh, that is reincarnated, right, uh, right. And so, however, the karmic I, I refer to it as a karmic stream, for lack of a better term. But the karma that one has in this lifetime can then be transferred to another being in a at a future time. Uh, typically, it's viewed uh, as forty nine days. Um, right. But now we're getting into a really long, involved uh, question. So I'll, I'll forestall talking about this in greater detail. I might do a Wednesday night about it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions or comments? No? Oh. Could you talk a little bit about this idea of using deep meditation 
to forestall illness. Did, did everybody hear his question? Okay. Um, well, what we're talking about is reading, reaching a meditative state. Imagine uh, how many weeks ago was it we talked about the medicine Buddha and the meditations that one does to the medicine Buddha as a way of not necessarily, well, theoretically at least curing disease, but at least mitigating the effects of disease. And so the deep meditation means going into a meditative state where you're actually perhaps forestalling or reversing the effects of the disease or whatever it may be. And that was a very common a feature of certain types of meditation. But the meditations the, to the medicine Buddha would be an example of that. I would imagine that at this level, you increase people's experience. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. May I? Uh, you know, I, I also find it the that on a on a much more mundane level, if he is experiencing disease, there may be other uh, equili with that. So if there's pain, there may be stress and anxiety around it. And it's saying it in the end, it's saying that Mara does come and visit. And so if there is an ailment, uh, on just on a basic level of meditation may have helped to ease or carry the disease better, not necessarily for stalling, but not letting it cascade into a much deeper pathology, um, just on a surface level. But yeah, I'm sure there is a deeper mystical aspect, but yeah. Um, Aaron, do you, is that a new hand up or is that from a question from before? It's a new hand. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, my question was actually, I know you said that um, th when the Buddha died in the Parinirvana, he went through multiple realms. Um, is I know that Saicho has, in Judo In, he has like his room still and he's still there. Is he in that same state? Well, how do you answer this? He would be in this. He would be in a state of immateriality. Would you? Would you say that Saichishima said? Say, would you say that Saicho in his tomb is in a state of immateriality? Yes. Well, at the Jodo in Temple, the Mount Hie, uh, the the priest uh, or monks uh, decided to stay there for twelve years, uh, serving. Uh, serving meals to uh, 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 Saicho as if he's still alive. And uh, that is a Jodo in temple. It's very quiet place and always clean there. And Rozan uh, no Biku, the bhikshus uh, or monks uh, who stay there um, for the 12 years at Mount He, as Saicho mentioned, uh, he, in his last word. And so the uh, uh, priest uh, uh, staying there never get out of Mount He for 12 years. So that is uh, one of the extreme, uh, what should I say, uh, practices at Mount He. The other one is Kaihogyo, running mountains around every day uh, for a thousand days, etc. cetera. Uh, these are another extreme uh, what should I say, uh, practices at uh, Mount Hie. So at the in the case of site, uh, uh, you know, or Jodoin, uh, this temple, uh, if you visit sometimes there, maybe you'll feel some very comfortable and quiet place as if uh, Saicho stays there. The, the same thing say maybe in uh, Mount Koya, uh, as if Kukai stayed there uh, everlasting and the priest uh, uh, brings meals a day to, to the uh, Okno in temple. So all the same style. Thank you. Yeah. And, and by the way, it, Sensei can confirm this. I think that Jodoin is the coldest place on Mount Hie, <laughs> where that tomb is located. It's always the cold. 
you, it can be, you know, uh, 30 degrees on the mountain, you know, 30 degrees Celsius on the mountain and you go down there, it's in a valley, you go down into the valley and it, it feels like at least 20 degrees colder than it is <laughs> farther on the mountain. Um, did you raise your hand again, Aaron, or is that from before? Okay. Oh, that was from before. Sorry about that. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Well, I think that I'm going to um, end the, I, I don't think people have many more questions and answers back here. Anybody? No? Okay. So I'm going to let the folks in here go on out and get started um, in the hondo, and then I'll continue here in the, on the Zoom session. Today, uh, Schumann is taking people out to the hondo and I'll stay inside. And then next week I'll go outside and probably Oshin will stay, will we'll stay on the Zoom. That's what we're, we're alternating. So I'm alternating every other week and then either Shumon or Koshin will do the service in the hondo. Recently, I was rereading sections from Robert Bella. His book, 19, a 1985 book titled Habits of the Heart, Individualism and Commitment in American Life. And by the way, Robert Bella is one of my favorite authors. He was a sociologist who studied religion, and he was a Japanologist, so he knew a great deal about Japan and wrote about Japanese history and culture. And his book title, Habits of the Heart, Individualism and Commitment in American Life, came from Alexa, the title of it came from Alexis de Tocqueville, a French aristocrat who used the expression. According to Wikipedia.org. Hold on a moment. I don't know why she did that. <laughs> For those who don't know, that was, I can't use her name <laughs> in the background. Anyway. Um, the title of, of Bella's book, Habits of the Heart, Individualism, and Commitment in American Life, came from Alexis de Tocqueville, a French aristocrat who used the expression habits of the heart for a mix of traits essential to national character, and especially how they applied to America. His works, Democracy in America in two volumes, were published in 1835 and 1840. And he was interested in the traditions that American Jews to make sense of themselves and their society. He presented one of today's major moral dilemmas, the conflict between our fierce individualism and the urgent need for community and commitment to one another. Now, he wrote in the early 19th century about democracy and forms of tyranny, the social contract majority rule and mediocrity, slavery, policies of assimilation, as well as other topics. The problems we find ourselves in today, into, the problems we find ourselves in today had their origins from the very beginning of this particular nation state. From de Tocqueville in the 1840s to Robert Bella in the 1970s to today, much of the modern and postmodern world has been on a search for meaning. And that was the very same task which Shakyamuni Buddha set out 2,500 years ago. In other words, the search that de Tocqueville talked about, that Bella talked about, that I'm talking about right now, is not a search that's unique to a time and a place, but a search that is part of being human. The understanding of the individual as an individual, a self, one place, one's place in society, and the search for meaning are addressed in the four marks of existence, namely impermanence, anita, discontentedness, dukkha, not self, anatman, and all things are empty of intrinsic existence and nature, shunyata. No matter how many times I read this or, or I'm reminded about it, it's a, like a light going off in my head. 
a new understanding, a flash of brilliance. It's so easy to forget the simple foundational teaching. Agreed. It doesn't pay the rent. It doesn't bring greater racial and socioeconomic and other forms of equity to our society. It doesn't solve an issue with our QAnon friends or relatives, but it does put into perspective where we as individuals exist within the cosmos. Without knowing it, Bella had intimated using different words for these four seals. I suspect that he had picked up these ideas through osmosis, through his reading Buddhist materials. And while not a Buddhist himself, at least not that I'm aware, he used these ideas to address the struggles previously mentioned. In recognition of Shakyamuni Buddha's death several millennia ago, we should re-examine how each of these four seals instruct us, using these as a reminder of our place in the cosmos as we move forward to be bodhisattvas. And from Basho Matsuo, the moon and sun are travelers through eternity. Even the years wander on whether drifting through life on a boat or climbing toward old age, leading a horse. Each day is a journey, and the journey itself is home. <laughs>